All right, let's talk Powerpuff Girls. More specifically, 2016 Powerpuff Girls. I've spent a great deal of time talking about this show. Honestly, more than any sane person ever should because, let's face it, this reboot isn't exactly a crowning achievement in the realm of animation or anything, but I have my reasons. Although, it's funny. I never intended on covering every single episode in the series. Originally, my first review was going to be a one-and-done thing, but I decided to experiment a little with Escape from Monster Island, Princess Buttercup, and The Stayover, and pretty soon I just found myself consistently working on episode reviews of this show. It's kind of funny now that I think about it. If it weren't for the support that I have been given doing this sort of thing, then you probably wouldn't be watching this video right now. This is why I continue to review this reboot long after the attention for it died down. I enjoy doing it. If I didn't like talking about this show, I wouldn't still be putting out countless videos on it. I prefer to give the show a fair chance instead of unreasonably hating every single episode without seeing it first like I've seen others do. Speaking of which, I want to take a moment to give a huge shout out to Bug-Eyed Freaks for her encouragement over the past year and a half, because I honestly wouldn't be where I am right now had she not given me a chance back when I was first starting out. She runs what is undoubtedly the best Powerpuff Girls blog on Tumblr, so if any of you are interested in more Puff after finishing this video, I highly recommend you give it a look. I'll leave a link in the description. Now, it suffice to say that the Powerpuff Girls reboot does not have the easiest repertoire of episodes to choose from when determining the best and worst candidates for a top 5 video. When I compiled my entries for both halves of this list, I classified episodes as either amazing or dreadful based on a few factors. The coherence of the story, the execution of the moral, characters' actions and behaviors, entertainment value, and creativity or lack thereof. I realize that some of the choices I made for this list are debatable and I'm not expecting this to be an all-encompassing, objective compilation that's meant to be taken as fact, but I am basing all of these placements on my experiences with these episodes. Do not be surprised if my opinions have changed on some of the entries on this list compared to when I first reviewed them, as a lot of my older reviews are outdated by my current standards. But without further ado, let's roll. This may come as a bit of a shock to some people out there, but not every episode of the 2016 Powerpuff Girls series turns out to be an egregious train wreck. During my time spent looking at these 40 episodes, I've managed to stumble across quite a selection of decent to good ones, some of which even managed to surprise me in ways I had not previously imagined. After giving it some thought, I've settled on a selection of the episodes that I consider to be the best of the bunch. It's so easy, even a baby can do it! can do it. Hmm. I'm pretty sure this baby has a PhD. When Bubbles is having difficulty working on a biome project for class, she asks Blossom for help since she's well acquainted with school projects and the like. Blossom willingly accepts her request and promises to work with her on the project after school, but later that day she begins to bite off more than she can chew as she also agrees to help Miss Keene write a speech for an upcoming assembly and assist the mayor after he lost the key to the city. The episode does an excellent job of showing off the everything nice aspect of Blossom's personality. She's doing her duty as a good Samaritan and superhero by helping those who are in need of help. Sure, she may not be fighting a giant monster or stopping Mojo Jojo from taking over the city again, but part of the superhero's job is also to complete more mundane tasks that need to be done around the city from time to time. If the reboot had more crime-centric episodes, People Pleaser could honestly fit right in as a break in between those higher, more intense moments. Slice of Life episodes of the Powerpuff Girls worked rather well in the original series because there was a balance between them and the more extreme ones. For every uh oh dynamo, there's a child fearing to balance it out. Unfortunately, the reboot doesn't have the same balance, but that doesn't discredit People Pleaser from being a good episode in and of itself. 
While Blossom is out doing her thing, Bubbles is still left hopelessly struggling with her science project when who should volunteer to help her but none other than Buttercup. In the first season of the reboot, she has typically been portrayed as a selfish brat who puts herself ahead of others time and time again. So seeing her step up to the plate in Bubbles' time of need is very reassuring in this situation. Normally she spends her time picking on her sister and she even does this right before realizing that something's wrong. But it's that moment of realization, that moment when she sees Bubbles is seriously upset because Blossom let her down that makes this such a significant highlight of the entire entire season. She shows that despite her constant bickering, deep down she still truly cares for Bubbles and wants to see her happy because they're sisters and they look out for each other. Displaying bonds among siblings like this is a trope that I've always, always been a fan of, and this case here is no exception. Buttercup continues to shine in this episode after her initial attempt at making the biome with Bubbles fails when she flies out to find Blossom's whereabouts and set things straight. She calls Blossom out on her neglect for Bubbles' feelings and snaps her back into shape. And when the biome appears on the scene leaving a wake of mayhem in its path, Blossom makes it up to Bubbles by beating down the Taiga monster and turning it into the best school project that Miss Keen's ever seen. I admire this episode for the emphasis it places on the sisterly bonds between the girls. It shows that despite Blossom's good intentions, intentions to help everyone she could, she shouldn't spread herself too thin because then she'll end up disappointing those she cannot aid. Her generosity in this episode is shown as a flaw. It takes Blossom's supportive character traits and puts an interesting twist on them, one that I certainly was not expecting to see. The only glaring weakness I can really find in this episode is the explanation for why the monster came into being. But other than that, People Pleaser definitely gets the Shadow Streak seal of sincere satisfaction. The taiga is the world's largest biome. It stores a huge amount of carbon, and it's home to the rough-legged buzzard known for its native call. Fuck what you heard! Well, it's up to you, Donnie. Is this something you want to try? As long as my BFF bubble says it's a good idea, I am down! Completely trust you, brah. Oh boy. Here we go. What may appear to be a harmless story about a girl on a fairy tale creature quickly devolves into quite the predicament, and it's truly a sight to behold, for all the wrong reasons. This episode revolves around the introduction of a reoccurring character in the series, Donnie, an unintentionally annoying unicorn who thinks he's a pony because he apparently has gone his whole life without touching his forehead or getting a haircut. Yes, he's actually a unicorn all along, but that isn't discovered until the end of the episode where he has his life-changing epiphany. Either way, it's definitely not a unicorn, it's just... sad. Shut the fuck up, Donnie. Horn Sweet Horn fails at providing a justified reason for feeling sympathy for Bubbles because it tries to make her both the protagonist and antagonist at the same time. It tricks us into thinking that she is deserving of a unicorn friend because of the way the other kids treat her during the opening minute of the episode, only for it to be flipped around when she takes advantage of Donnie once he appears right in front of her. Now, I can relate with Bubbles' struggle here. I share her pain. I'm still waiting for the day that Pokemon become real so I can get myself an Umbreon, but yeah, that's never gonna happen. There's no such thing as unicorns. There is so! I can prove it! Behold, a real life unicorn horn! Stand back, everyone! I shall summon one! <gasps> <laughs> this must be what bronies are like in real life. Donnie gives her some brief exposition that despite having the physical appearance of a pony, he's always felt that he has been a unicorn at heart. Bubbles, instead of being kind and supportive of her new friend's struggle, decides to manipulate him into becoming a unicorn so that she can have her own selfish desires fulfilled and garner the attention of her classmates by proving them wrong. This is where the first misstep of this episode comes into play, as it is showing that Bubbles does not actually respect Donnie's own wishes to become what he truly feels he should be, she only wants to put him through this for her own personal gain, and to be the popular girl in school. And I'll be friends with a real life unicorn! Yeah! And everyone will see how wrong they were! He needs this! I need this! 
Through the help of Bubbles' support and the Professor's transmutation ray, Donnie attempts to undergo surgery to become a majestic being of grace without paying attention to any of the consequences. Gee, way to encourage the act of getting surgery there. But ultimately ends up devolving into this monstrous, hideous beast, and not the good kind. The episode then throws Donnie into the antagonist role as he goes around terrorizing the town until Bubbles confronts him, where he falls off a building and nearly dies until he's saved by a bunch of other unicorns who then go on to show him that he was also a unicorn the entire time. Again, completely undermining the moral that this episode miserably fails to convey, as well as making all of the characters, especially Donnie, look like idiots for never checking underneath his haircut in the first place. Now, this is obviously a metaphor for something, but I'm pretty sure most guys haven't gone a single day without checking their dick. And despite Bubbles' apology, it doesn't feel like it's enough to make up for the trauma and torture that she just put Donnie through, all because she was selfish. Donnie is also responsible for his own demise, however, because he's ignorant enough to just follow through with this. Sure, Bubbles is part of the reason why he becomes a hideous monster, but it's also his fault for trusting a girl he literally just met and for not reading the warnings the professor gave him before agreeing to the procedure. If he honestly believes he has every right to put all of the blame on Bubbles for causing this, should he have really been saved when he fell off the building? I didn't mean to. Oh no, what have I done? Sure are exhilarating. Well, you saw it here first. Apparently, if you try to change yourself, you'll turn into a hideous monster and get mocked by all of society. I'm genuinely impressed that nobody managed to pick up on this during the early production stages. Were there any test screenings for this episode given before it was made public? I'm aware that the lead writer of this episode came out and apologized for the message this episode conveyed as it was, according to her, never intended to have these themes associated with it. I respect that. I'm willing to believe this writer is telling the truth and sincerely never wanted to cause the trouble that it did. But, Something is still going on here, because there is plenty of evidence embedded in Horn Sweet Horn that indicates the show's intentions of appealing to that demographic are true. Whether it's the subliminal motion of Buttercup knocking what could be argued to be a phallic object off of Donnie's head here, the specific coloring of the ending heart screen for this episode and this episode alone, mind you, being similar to a certain flag, the fact that this device is specifically called a trans mutation ray instead of something like a unicorn conversion ray or the metamorphosizer, for example. Maybe somebody else decided to go ahead and edit the script or storyboards accordingly. There's no real way to tell. But no one single person should be to blame for this. Some may argue that these parallels are just a coincidence and aren't meant to mean anything, and I can see where they're coming from. But when the episode includes blatant moments like this, this is your body and it's a serious choice. It's pretty obvious what's being said here. I'm not saying I agree or disagree with all of these details, but this episode in particular is notorious for its failure to convey a proper message that couldn't go without being mentioned. Quite frankly, I don't know how this episode would have gone over had it not been advertised the way that it was. I'd assume it wouldn't have been as bad, but at the same time this episode came out during the peak of reboot hate, so for all we know it might not have actually changed anything. And be sure to grab a pickle shoot, available at the gift shop. Oh, what a world! fly on the Triceratops in real life. One day, Blossom. One day. The internet is one of the most fascinating advances in human technology that the world has ever seen. As smartphones, computers, game consoles, and more began to rise in popularity at the turn of the 21st century, technology became the dominant driving force behind many people's lives. One of the biggest growth seen over the course of the 2010s is that of the mobile gaming market. It started with apps like Angry Birds and Words with Friends, which really served as the pioneers of the industry's boom that eventually led us to have the huge huge library of mobile games that litter the app stores of today. What does this have to do with the Powerpuff Girls reboot? Well, I'm glad you asked, specific person watching my video right now. The Powerpuff Girls reboot decides to capitalize on mobile gaming with an episode titled Viral Spiral, in which Bubbles creates a hot new app that's taken her school by storm. 
She's said to have been doing this for a while now, and she follows up with her naming some of the other apps she's created. I love to make games. Remember two weeks ago when I made that Mojo meme generator? That was you? Or when I made that Pug Your Mug app? Personally, while I do prefer for Blossom to have been chosen to be the programmer character in the show because her organized and analytical qualities make her more suited to the hobby compared to Bubbles' artsy natural traits, eh, this isn't enough to be considered a detriment to this episode's reputation. Personally, I think it would have been a better idea if Bubbles had been the designer of the game and Blossom had been the coder, but, you know, beggars can't be choosers, I guess. Viral Spiral exists as a commentary on the internet culture of the mid-2010s. Cartoons have been doing the go inside the internet thing for years before the Powerpuff reboot got to it, but the magical thing about these kinds of episodes is that they're always going to be different as technology advances. An episode about being inside the web from 10 years ago is going to be outdated compared to now, and an episode written in 2027 will be moderately different from an episode of today. Let's look at the Fairly Odd Parents episode Information Stupor Highway for a second here. A lot of the visuals are out of date by today's standards. I mean, it's got what appears to be a Windows 98 operating system for starters, and the upload speeds have improved exponentially since then. The same can be expanded out to technology in general. Movies, shows, it doesn't matter. If technology is involved in some way, then it is going to become outdated at one point or another. Not even the Jetsons can escape this fate. This is why it's not really fair to penalize Viral Spiral for becoming dated in this specific case, as any episode with this premise has this flaw. After Blossom and Buttercup finish praising Bubbles for creating the brand new best game ever, the focus shifts over to the Amoeba Boys who just so happen to be thinking up a way to ruin the Powerpuff Girls' reputation and become the biggest bad guys in Townsville. They are quickly approached by a mysterious man named Silico who offers them an opportunity to work together and take the Powerpuff Girls down once and for all. You are the Amoeba Boys, correct? The most notorious villains in Townsville? Who's asking? Now, I'll be getting to this guy in a minute, but first and foremost, let's look at the Amoeba Boys seeing as this is their one and only appearance this entire season. The three of these guys are a strange case in this reboot because they still appear to be the dopey, incompetent villains as they were in the original, However, they end up becoming a threat in a way that kinda contradicts their stupidity. When they agree to work together with Silico, he transports the Amoeba Boys inside the internet so they can start running amok and causing havoc all over the World Wide Web, including Bubbles' new mobile app, which is what gives their location away later on. They're purposely seen messing with people's videos, shopping carts, and more. I think this would have worked better had they been running around and accidentally causing these things to happen instead, as what we're given makes them look more competent than what they're made out to be during their introduction. I do have to say though, I thought it was pretty clever that the single-celled organisms were the ones chosen to go around and infect everything. Yeah, amoebas and viruses are technically two different things, but I can see what the show is going for, and I'll still give it some points for that. As for Silico, he's an entirely different beast. In his second episode, Halt and Catch Silico, it is revealed that he is seeking revenge on the girls for unintentionally destroying his robot friends during a monster battle. In my review, I state how his backstory conflicts with continuity and his motives aren't exactly the greatest, but those factors do not play a role in this episode specifically. Within Viral Spiral itself, he is kept in the shadows as a mysterious villain who simply wants to take control of the internet, and his threatening status is maintained because the interaction between him and the girls is kept to a minimum. It is awesome seeing him get the Amoeba Boys to do the dirty work for him, and despite their defeat at the end of the episode, he still manages to pull through and reign victorious over the girls without them even realizing it. Silico's role in this episode specifically was exceptional because it was a rare case of the Powerpuff Girls reboot, leaving me wanting more. I was genuinely looking forward to his subsequent appearances to find out what he would do next, and while I was unfortunately disappointed because he just decided to become a shit poster on Reddit, I cannot deny that Viral Spiral did a tremendous job of setting him up. Besides, if Silico would have been more troubled by his house being destroyed instead of those robots that he could have easily rebuilt from recycling the scraps or buying new materials, I would have been a little more lenient with his character back then. There's only really one character in this episode that I can't stand. Sorry girls, I guess I just don't understand computers. <laughs> this is my least favorite joke in the entire show. 
But switching back to positive vibes, I find it interesting how the reboot capitalizes on the 2010s era of internet here. There are genuine gags that reference things like autocorrect and internet trolls, both of which were gotten down to a T, and several references are also made as parody sites, such as Hulu, eBay, and YouTube. Funnily enough, you're probably watching this video on YouTube right now. Unless, of course, you downloaded it somehow, or somebody else decided to go ahead and upload it to another site without my permission, in which case, please check me out on YouTube because I'd really appreciate it, and be sure also to follow me on social media, specifically Twitter and Tumblr, as that's where I tend to be active most of the time. The majority of this episode is spent with the girls chasing the Amoeba Boys through the internet and trying to stop them before they can infect the central mainframe and cause a worldwide phenomenon that could ruin the internet forever. Aside from the rapping and the aforementioned professor joke that didn't humor me at all, there isn't anything about this episode that is necessarily bothersome. I'd also like to give the reboot credit for cooperating with MIT Media Lab's lifelong kindergarten group for starting up an initiate known as Make It Fly, which provided younger kids with the tools that allowed them to program Powerpuff Girls related games and animations using the educational programming language Scratch. With the success of Cartoon Network's first initiative featuring Wee Bear Bears, integrating the Powerpuff Girls into a similar program seems like a great idea. Considering computer science is rising in demand with these new advancements in technology, an initiative like this may inspire kids to eventually become interested in artificial intelligence or software engineering, for example. I have to say, everything else aside, it's nice to see Cartoon Network doing something like this. And hopefully more initiatives like this can continue to inspire kids in the future. This is the worst. I couldn't have said it better myself, Buttercup. Well, fourth worst, but still. I had once mentioned that I found an interview article regarding the 2016 Powerpuff Girls' initial premiere, stating that the intent behind this show was never to age the girls up, put them in roller skates, and send them to Mars. Quite frankly, I realize that this statement is implying that the show never aimed on becoming too wacky or random, and that it wanted to remain grounded at its core, but considering the fact that all three of these things do end up happening in the show at one point or another, albeit independently, I can't help but raise an eyebrow. As the title of this episode suggests, The Wrinkle Gruff Gals focuses on the girls wanting to be aged up a few years so that they can stop being picked on at school for their youth. It's an episode about bullying that, just like Horn Sweet Horn failed with accepting yourself, completely screws up a message about dealing with bullying. But before I get to all that, allow me to expand upon the other half of its problems, continuity. The Powerpuff Girls reboot indulges in a practice that I like to call selective continuity, for lack of a better term. It only chooses to abide by established continuity when it wants to. This can be seen within the episode itself and across the entire season as a whole. For example, the reboot follows its own continuity in the sense that none of the episodes that were produced before the episode Power Up Puff feature the girls using their Green Lantern powers. This, of course, differed with the airing order getting mixed up from the original plans, but it's not the cartoon's fault for that happening. However, other times, as is the case with Silica's backstory as I mentioned earlier, it completely breaks its established canon. How could the Powerpuff Girls have ruined his life all those many years ago if they're still only like six years old in this reboot? In the case of the Wrinklegruff Gals, the episode opens up with the narrator saying, Aww, it's the first day of school. Implying that episodes such as Horn Sweet Horn and Princess Buttercup take place after these events, despite the production order having them listed beforehand. See, this is what I mean. Why does continuity follow along with the girls using their new powers, but not with them when they go to school? The show is so particular with what it does and does not choose to follow. The same can be said for Donnie. His first episode, Horn Sweet Horn, is clearly meant to take place before the episode Odd Bubbles Out, and it follows the production code order. Same for Man Up and Man Up 2. So, why here? Why does this episode break that trend? Was the Wrinklegruff Gals truly intended to be the very first episode of the reboot? The premise is the first day of school after all. Even then, that leads to another separate contradiction within the chronological progression of the reboot. If the girls had already gone to kindergarten the previous year, why are they going back for a second time? Shouldn't they be headed to an elementary school regardless of whether or not Pokey Oaks was shut down? 
I will admit, I do appreciate the consideration for shouting out the original series here with Bubbles' old design, as well as the cameos made by students from the old series, but that doesn't excuse the logical progression in the girls' education. It's been unclear since the very beginning of the series exactly what grade the girls and the rest of the students in the school are supposed to be in. I've been referring to their school as an elemental high school throughout most of my reviews because there's no clear answer on this. And the Wrinklegruff Gals is primarily responsible for this confusion since it acts as the introductory episode. According to Run Blossom Run, the name of their school is Midway Elementary. I'm not against the idea of the girls being put into an elementary school as a way of differentiating the reboot from the original show, but if other kids in the backgrounds look and act more like middle schoolers, then it becomes a little confusing. When the girls enter their new school, they are immediately bullied and picked on by the older students for being so young and looking like babies. Later that night, the girls demand that the professor make them a serum that would age them up a bit so that they wouldn't get picked on anymore, only for them to find out the next morning that they're about 80 years old because they decided to drink more of the solution than they were supposed to. the professor won't notice. Of course I noticed. Honestly though, considering what I've seen this reboot do with older puff designs, I'm actually pretty glad they just skipped straight ahead to 80 years old. They go back to school, and just as they were picked on the day before, they're bullied once again by these insignificant, nameless kids, aside from Big Joey of course. As if that weren't bothersome enough, the solution to this bullying problem is all the more vexatious. Instead of the girls standing up for themselves or seeking out assistance from others who care about them or literally any other reasonable solution to teach kids how to prevent bullying, they realize that the best way to get their detractors to leave them alone is to just give them things for free. That's brilliant. Okay, it's understandable that some might say a knitted cap, some pieces of candy, and a few made up stories aren't worth very much, but what is this teaching? Replace these items with lunch money, a gaming device, and some action figures, and this becomes a totally realistic situation. Kids aren't just going to magically become friends with their bullies because they gave away their Nintendo Switch to them. They're going to continue to get picked on and have things stolen from them. That's how these things work. The icing on top of the cake is that the girls could have easily bribed all of these kids to like them without even having to age themselves up. Other than giving Buttercup's speech a little bit more credibility, which even then doesn't work for anyone who has a basic understanding of human history because of all the fallacies she's spewing out, the girls didn't need to be 80 years old to give the kids candy and knit them a hat. It appears that the only reason this particular concept was even chosen for an episode idea was to make old person jokes. My teeth won't even stay in! What? Speak up! I can't hear you! <sighs> <laughs> Powerpuff Girls! Mojo! You are wrinkly old ladies! Are you sure that's Mojo? It looks like a cactus or something. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I would have rather the episode take place in a situation where it was more fitting. Take the episode Greenwing from season 2 for example. This episode also contains its fair share of jokes about the elderly, but the events that take place and the side characters involved are far more fitting because the location is set in a retirement home. There is one sequence in which the girls try to use their superpowers to stop Mojo Jojo towards the latter half of the episode that capitalizes on this, but everything before that moment could have happened without the need for them to be elderly women. I suppose if I had to compliment this episode for doing something right, it was nice seeing all of the kids team up to take Mojo down at the end once they were united by the girls. It's a little annoying that this acts as one of the many examples where the girls can't do a job themselves and need to rely on others for help, but the fact that they've essentially brought the school together makes this case a little less severe in comparison. Aside from that, the rest of the episode is mediocre at best. There's also the inclusion of a random subplot where the episode ends up creating this weird monster while working on an antidote, but it literally adds nothing to the episode. In fact, I completely forgot these cutaways were even a thing until I came back to watch it for this video. They're that forgettable. Giving your bullies what they want is not the solution to stop bullying. No bully is going to magically want to become your friend just because you gave them some of your candy. They're probably going to take what's yours and then come back for more the next day. Obviously, I don't speak for everyone, 
but the odds of this failing for someone are way higher than the chance of them befriending their harasser. As someone who was bullied when they were younger, I just have to say, I find this episode very misleading and very inaccurate. Well, now that we're old, at least we'll get some respect. I take it back. This is officially the worst. An unfortunate side effect of watching a series as widely hated as something like Powerpuff Girls 2016 or Teen Titans Go is that a lot of the good episodes end up getting underlooked because they just get clumped in with the bad ones on reputation alone. A lot of people have this mindset that if the show itself is bad, then every single episode is bad too. Just as I defended episodes like Colors of Raven, Girls' Night Out, Opposites, and The Cape from Teen Titans Go in a video I did describing a lot of the things I like about that particular show, I'm going to defend one of these reboot episodes right here, right now. Looks like it's over for the Powerpuff Girls. What? They need a leader. Wait, I'm the leader. Powers or no powers, my sisters need me. Before I clean this up. Power Up Puff, an episode about Bubbles and Buttercup getting brand new Green Lantern powers and leaving Blossom in the dust because of her lack thereof, is one episode that I was massively underappreciative of back when I initially reviewed it a long time ago. Now don't get me wrong, the concept itself is not original. If anything, this episode is just a mishmash of ideas from nothing special in the main event from the classic series, however I can safely say that despite this fact, the episode itself is still good, unlike most of the other episodes that just blatantly stole from the original. Power Up Puff begins with the girls going to stop a giant pig monster from destroying the city after they see it come to life on a live rendition of the TV show Sliced, an obvious parody of the show Chopped, produced by Food Network. That is copywritten. Monster battles are such a rarity in this reboot that going back to this fight after so long is such a breath of fresh air. This battle has legitimate visible impacts in which we see Buttercup smash this pig in a blanket straight through two skyscrapers to take it down. Minimal censoring, proper sound editing, Despite being a bit slow, everything it needs is still here, and the same can be said for the fight with the meatloaf monster later on as well. Sure, it's not as amazing as the intense, grotesque action we've seen in the original, but it's still perfectly fine in its own right. Yes, I understand that the girls' Green Lantern powers puts them in this sort of protective bubble so they themselves aren't coming in direct contact with the pig and meatloaf monsters, but that isn't enough to diminish the fight. At least for me. I'd even go so far as to say this episode has the best fights in the entire season, not counting that one hard punch from the episode Princess Buttercup. <laughs> Blossom is forced to cope with the fact that she doesn't acquire her new powers that her sisters do during the fight with the pig monster, and the following scene builds this up even further when she's pressured at school or forced to sit and watch her sisters have the time of their lives. It's interesting to me that Blossom deals with her jealousy internally rather than actively going out of her way to do something about it. She induces self-deprecation by placing herself in a position where she believes to be inferior to her sisters because she was incapable of stopping the pig monster without those special powers. It leads to the ultimate question of who she really is as she tries to figure out her own identity. You ever fail at something you thought you were good at so badly that it makes you question whether or not you were ever good at it at all? That's exactly what Blossom is going through. It certainly doesn't help that her own father has nothing of value to say to her in her time of need. Professor, when do you think I'll get my new powers? You might never get them. In fact, you might lose the powers you have and end up being just an ordinary little girl. Uh, well, I love you. Good night. Well, thanks for nothing. There are so many obstacles standing in Blossom's way that it utterly palmerizes her into the ground. She's gotten to the point where not even going out and fighting a different giant monster can lift her spirits, and her sisters end up heading out without her to try and stop it. Despite their best efforts, they can't seem to bring it down, and it is then that Blossom realizes her sisters are nothing without her. They need a leader, and she is the one fit for that title. I love this epiphany, because Blossom realizes her own self-worth that she does have a place amongst her sister's sides and that she is worthwhile, powers or no powers. It's such a feel-good ending that even when the world gets you down, things can work themselves out in the end even if life doesn't go exactly the way you planned. 
To address the elephant in the room, no, the Green Lantern powers do not bother me in this episode specifically despite primarily existing to sell toys. Why? Honestly, that whole selling toys argument has never really bothered me as much as it does other people. Not to say there's anything wrong with that because I totally get where they're coming from and they make very valid arguments against the practice, but I'm so used to it and truth be told, as long as those inclusions don't outright interfere with the episode itself, I don't really care. I've always enjoyed watching shows like Batman Beyond, TMNT, Ben 10, Friendship is Magic, Pokemon Yu-Gi-Oh, and even a little bit of Transformers here and there, despite the fact that all of them are merchandise driven in one way or another. As a matter of fact, I was never a kid who wanted a lot of toys anyways, seeing as I never asked my parents for merchandise from any show, aside from the ones based off of video games and trading cards. Yes, I'm obviously referring to Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh here. I'm actually a really big fan of the original Yu-Gi-Oh run, but I'll save those thoughts for another day. If the episodes that include these toy advertisements aren't just advertisements, but also cohesive stories that utilize said products in non-intrusive ways, then it's no big deal to me. I watch a cartoon for entertainment. As long as the characters aren't just sitting there saying, buy our toys, then I'm not gonna bat an eye. Although, don't get it twisted. There is a lot of justified evidence supporting the idea that Cartoon Network only revived the Powerpuff Girls franchise to make a quick buck that would bank off of people's nostalgia for the old show given the series' massive success, and I'm not supportive of that. You know, Powerpuff Girls, in the story, you have to save the world before bedtime, right? So this is your bedroom set, right? And you know Bubbles, she plays all around. You also have Professor Plutonium that comes in this set, only this set. I do not approve of lazily bringing a show back, slapping it together with minimal effort and an outrageous number of flaws, and calling it a day. No, this still bothers me to no end, but that's a problem with the creation of the reboot as a whole. In the case of Power Up Puff specifically, the inclusion of the Green Lantern powers is not an impediment to the storytelling because it serves as the driving force behind Blossom's depression. Am I bothered by the fact that these things are actual toys? No, not really, because I never intended on buying any reboot merch to begin with. So to clarify, I'm not bothered by the toys themselves, I'm bothered by the reason why the toys were made in the first place. Quite frankly, collecting merchandise isn't something I really ever do, unless you count collecting video games, but that's about it. Even in the case of the original series, the only official merch I've ever bought was two copies of the DVD box set, but that's it. Don't get me wrong, I'd still like to buy a few more classic Powerpuff related things if I'm ever given the chance, but I'm not a collector of any sort. I'm just indifferent to the entire concept in general, really. The reboot merchandise is something I tend to stay away from because I have no interest in the products, and besides, I don't think very much of it is very captivating anyways. I mean, what kid is actually going to go up to their mom or dad and start begging for them to buy this dinky little plastic stapler anyways? Thrilling. Brilliant idea right there. Office supplies. Yep, that's sure to be a hit with the kids. So, to conclude, I'm not against the Green Lantern powers in the episode because they serve a purpose in the story. I can relate to some of the ways Blossom deals with depression and enjoy seeing her overcome it in the end, and the monster battles were pretty good for this reboot standards. I'm really glad I got the chance to come back to Power Up Puff once again for this video because this entry was quite a shock and surprise to me when I realized how good it actually was. With that said, this entry concludes part one of this countdown video. Stay tuned for part two where I pick back up with the third worst episode of season one, and I'll see you guys then. Come on girls, let's go save the day. And the ratings.